Maybe that's impossible. Hey, girl. You look just like your mother. I promise you, I am gonna get her back. Genetic power has now been unleashed. We made a terrible mistake. The doomsday clock might be about out of time. If our world's gonna survive, what matters is what we do now. I can use your expertise. You coming or what? A baby raptor? I made a promise we would bring her home. You made a promise? To a dinosaur. Yeah. Why? Universal and Amblin's Jurassic World Dominion topped last weekend's domestic box office with 145 million, and globally it has already exceeded 400 million. In this episode, our guest is director and co writer Colin Trevorrow. Today he talks with us about the making of the new movie, which brought together two generations of franchise characters. That includes Laura Dern as Dr. Ellie Sattler, Jeff Goldblum as Dr. Ian Malcolm, and Sam Neill as Dr. Alan Grant from Jurassic Park, along with Chris Pratt as Owen Grady and Bryce Dallas Howard as Claire Deering, who first appear in 2015's Jurassic World, which Trevorrow also directed and co-wrote. I'm Carolyn Jardina. Welcome to The Hollywood Reporter's Behind the Screen. Colin, congratulations on the movie, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So to start, would you look back and tell us about the first time you saw Jurassic Park and what your recollection was of, uh, of your response at the time? Uh, I was 16 years old, and I was living in Oakland, California with my parents, uh, who had grounded me. Uh, because of something that I had I had done or said, uh, I'm sure it was deserved, and I was not allowed to see movies. That's that's kind of how you, that's what you took away from me, um, and what I loved. And my friend uh, Dan Rosen was was working in the projection booth of the Grand Lake Theater, uh, which is this beautiful old movie palace in Oakland. If if you've never been, and he called me up and he's like, "Listen, if you can get down here at midnight on Thursday night, we have to run Jurassic Park." It's all, you know, it's on reels. So we got to run these plates through and you can watch the movie. So I, I snuck out of my house and I rode my bike down there uh, at midnight and like full on, like put the pillows beneath the bed and everything uh, beneath the covers and watched the movie alone uh, in this amazing movie theater, just seated by myself. And um, it was extraordinary because I was I was already thinking about, you know, the craft uh, and the form of it because I wanted to be a filmmaker and that's what you do. And and yet over the course of it, all of my cynicism was stripped away and I just became a child. And, and it, the thing I remember about that specifically is how it defined a bit of my – hopefully what my style became is, is making you forget everything uh, that you – might know about movies because you're not thinking about how it's directed. You're not thinking about the craft of it. You are completely immersed in the adventure and you're a part of it. Well, for the new movie, you wrote the screenplay with Emily Carmichael and you brought together the two eras of Jurassic Park. Um, would you just talk about the concept for the story? Yeah, well, the, you know, the concept for the story, uh, we, we originally built the skeleton of when we we wrote the second film. So Derek and I, after Jurassic World, came out you know, with sort of a general piece of architecture that we felt like we could uh, allow, you know, take two movies to to really tell. And uh, and I think once people see this film, they'll they'll see how it's connected to Fallen Kingdom and how that really was, you know, the first part of the story. And uh, and then Emily, when she came in to start writing, we uh, we took that and and then really uh, delved into character and, and understanding how. Uh, specifically uh, where Claire was at the beginning of this movie and where Ellie was, was going to drive uh, our parallel uh, plots forward that would eventually reveal themselves to be the same plot in the same story. Um, so we actually, uh, I had a, uh, a group of futurists and geneticists and scientists uh, in Tel Aviv uh, come together when I was there for a film festival and just talk about um, scenarios. Uh, and, the, and the question that I put to them was, what is a, 
global ecological disaster that only uh, genetic power uh, and the manipulation of genetic power could cause that that a paleobotanist would recognize before everybody else. It's a very specific ask. Uh, and what they came up with is the is what we did in the film. This movie wears its cautionary tale on its sleeve. Uh, and and I think, you know, it's it's not my my job is not to um, instruct anyone how to think or how to be or or, or educate people through these uh, very fun and, and sometimes insanely ridiculous dinosaur movies. But at the same time, I do believe that uh, the, the treatment of these animals over the past three movies uh, does allow us to think about our, our treatment of, of other living things on the planet and our treatment of the planet itself. And the manipulation of genetic power, uh, the hubris with, with which that is treated, the thirst for power that many of our villains have had uh, and, and thirst for profit that many of them have had. These are all uh, real world issues that we deal with right now. And I think if we probably dealt with uh, more demonstrably in the past couple of years uh, than ever before. Uh, so the reason why these characters are afraid is not too dissimilar from the reasons why we're afraid. We've also researched uh, the human genome and learned a lot. We have learned a lot. And, and it, it was very important to Emily and I uh, that that side of the science, the, the identity of, of, Maisie Lockwood, uh, how she was created, uh, that, that end up being an emotional answer, uh, as opposed to just a scientific answer. Uh, and yet the science of it is actually what fuses the two stories together in the end. So it's, it's very important as well. Uh, it was, as you can imagine, a, a little bit scary to, to make a dinosaur movie where it's, its plot is not distinctly dinosaur related. It is, but, uh, somewhat tangentially. And, uh, it was it was a very conscious choice to think about you know Crichton's intention with Jurassic Park uh, about the messages about the, the dangers of genetic power and and how dinosaurs are really uh, more of an example or a metaphor of them as opposed to you know the literal danger um, and and you know if whenever I stay up nights uh, the thing that echoes my head is should it just have been about dinosaurs couldn't you just just you know take the layup make it about dinosaurs but. Uh, but I, I feel like what we did uh, is something that's a little bit more conscious of our moment. Was Campbell Scott's antagonist, Lewis Dodgson, now biased and CEO based on anyone? I mean, if anyone, he's, yeah, he's based on this character that, that, that Campbell saw, saw in his brain and, and very uh, determinedly you know, helped craft over the course of this movie. Uh, we wrote together. Uh, he had a very specific way that this character would talk. I think that, you know, there are a lot of uh, kind of, High, highly functional, uh, you know, insane people, many of whom are my personal friends and who I love very much. But uh, the idea that somebody uh, who, you know, grew up, uh, came up as an underling, came up as the guy who gives a, a shaving cream can uh, to some dude in Costa Rica uh, and now has suddenly uh, found a way to to not just be in power, but to have to be deemed the face of, of the work of so many others. And in this case, you know, he's the face of the work of a lot of really young, brilliant people uh, who, who don't fully understand, or even if they do understand, they don't, they want to look the other way. They don't want to admit that maybe the choices being made by this guy who's supposedly their hero uh, are pretty suspect. When you approached Laura Dern, Sam Neill and Jeff Goldblum, what did they say? Uh, well, they said yes uh, immediately, but I could tell just because I know each of them so well now that there was a caveat there and, and they really wanted to know why they were coming back. And, and I knew why to a certain extent, but, but not enough to, to, for even me to feel comfortable uh, because we were making them fully fledged characters in this movie. They're, they're not here to be you know paraded around uh, in some kind of cameo. And, and honestly, you know, Jeff Goldblum wasn't uh, presented in the last film for that reason either. He was very uh, deliberate uh, to, to make him the bookend that leads into this film, if, if only to assure the audience that, you know, these characters do exist in this world uh, as we move forward. Um, but, you know, Emily and I had long conversations with Laura Dern about how she feels about the world today and how she feels Ellie Sattler would look at the world. Uh, I find actors to be the authority on their characters, a greater authority than I could ever be because they've been playing them for 28 years and they think about, uh, in, a lot, in a lot of cases, solely them and then how they relate and react to others around them, whereas I think about a million things. So if I want to know how Ellie Sattler would feel, I ask Laura Dern. 
Well, let's dive into the making of this movie. Um, for starters, would you discuss your decision to shoot the movie on film? Uh, I shoot on film. I, I find it to be um, not just the best quality available, but um, the most textured and immersive uh, medium that we have. Uh, I found that you know a lot of these new digital cameras, uh, and not all of them, and there's incredible, incredible cameras that are available. Uh, I feel like a lot of, of our content has, has begun to look very similar. Uh, because it's, I'm not going to say it's easy to make things look beautiful. It's never easy. Uh, but the cameras are, are able to work with light in a very different way. And, and I think that, uh, the imperfections of film, uh, the, the way that it, it feels timeless to me, like this movie will outlive me when I watch it, when I see it on a TV in a bar, I, I feel like it looks different from everything else around it. And that's something that, uh, that I really love. And then you reteamed with your cinematographer, John Schwartzman. Uh, you did a lot of location work and you also had the challenges of, um, of COVID when you were shut down for a while. Do you want to just talk a little bit about the shoot itself? Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we, we shot for a couple of weeks and then we had to shut down and we had three months where we were trying to figure out just how to return to production. We were the first uh, production to, to come back. And so we built a plan uh, that really became the blueprint for for how everybody came back. And, and we made it open source. We sent this book that we had created of how to do it to every other production who asked. And it, I think it gave us a bit more of a sense of purpose. We were putting people back to work. It was more than just making a piece of entertainment. Um, and however much we wanted the piece of entertainment to be good and meaningful, uh, that other layer of, of having met our crew and knowing them and, and recognizing that, you know, crews, you know, tend to work you know, month to month. Like you don't, you, you do rely on that paycheck. And, uh, so it was, it was deeply satisfying for all of us to, to be able to, you know, obviously like, you know, we didn't get to see our families, there were sacrifices made, but if the result of that is that everybody's working again, uh, then that, that was definitely a worthy sacrifice. And you were shooting in, let's go over the locations. You were in Malta, we were, yeah, we were in British Columbia, which we had shot already before the pandemic. And then we were in the UK and we shot in Malta. Uh, and there's a lot of shots from from elsewhere. Uh, we we took, sent a play team to Switzerland. And, you know, there's there's other images in the movie that uh, even during COVID, I, I, I realized that, you know, a lot of the times if it's just a dinosaur, we're just going out and getting a visual effects plate. Uh, and so now any image is a plate for a dinosaur. So I, I went into stock footage and started finding things that I could then put through the ILM pipeline and animate something into it. That opening sequence with the Mosasaurus is all footage from the deadliest catch uh, where it attacks the boat. We didn't shoot any of it. Uh, and <laughs> Uh, so to start, if we're going to talk about production, that's, that's where it starts. The opening of this movie, uh, is, is actual footage of, of, uh, you know, real crab fishermen in a bad situation. The dinosaurs of the 1993 film are iconic and really did, you know, represent a turning point in the visual effects industry. This time around, you created 27 different key dinosaurs and, um, 10 of which were new to this film, which was the most challenging dinosaur for you to do? Uh, the feathers were hard. Uh, the Therizinosaurus and the Pyroraptor were really hard. And, and those were the ones that took the longest to develop because we didn't really have any baseline for it. Stan Winston uh, kind of informed us long ago what carnivores in Jurassic Park look like, what the herbivores look like. This is a feathered, uh, violent herbivore. Uh, and of, of massive size that's not shaped, it doesn't have the silhouette of any other dinosaur. Uh, with the pyroraptor, we had to understand how feathers reacted to wind, ice, water, uh, all of these other elements that uh, it would be hard enough already just to, to understand how you know feathers would have looked at that time. So we had we built an animatronic uh, for the pyroraptor, which actually kind of educated us on both of them uh, just to understand uh, you know how the light is going to play off of these feathers was really challenging um, and there was this table of four women in the uh, in John Nolan's animatronics department who were just collecting feathers from all around the world all these different birds and laying them out in different patterns and seeing how they went together and then understanding how they would lay over a skin to like you know, be flat, you know, the way that a swan or, or a duck is. Uh, and it's really, I don't, those animals are miracles. Birds are miracles. I do not know how uh, that, uh, that creature evolved. So it was, yeah, it was, it was pretty fascinating to try and reproduce it. Well, you, you, you mentioned the animatronics. So again, this was a combination of animatronics and digital work. Again, very consistent with the look and feel of the original film. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it was a priority, and in, in, in each of the films, we've been able to use more. JAA built two beautiful ones uh, in the last film, the T-Rex that they're that uh, Owen and Claire are with in the container, and then uh, Blue, which I honestly I think is the most beautiful animatronic that I've, I've seen in any of our movies, uh, what they did there. Um, to be able to, to have a scene that is uh, emotional uh, with a dinosaur that is being shot practically as that was, there's no visual effects in it. Um, I thought his work was remarkable, so it, it really energized me to try and uh, you know, continue in that spirit. And would you talk about the research involved in creating these to make them authentic? Uh, well, we have a, a paleont paleontologist, uh, Steve Broussat, who, uh, although I, it might be Broussati, I'm, I'm realizing I may have been saying it wrong this whole time, so we're going get, to get back to you on that. <laughs> I apologize to Steve because uh, people would mispronounce my name all the time. Um, he uh, is is preeminent at the moment. He's out of Edinburgh, uh, and he wrote this book called The Rise and Fall of Dinosaurs that really demonstrated that he understands uh, feathered dinosaurs in a way that that, that makes him a, a true expert and, and somebody we could rely on. So on this film, unlike even the previous films, I, I just gave him direct access to uh, David Vickery in visual effects to John Nolan in animatronics uh, and and then to Kevin Jenkins in production design. So all of us uh, were able to to call an expert at any given moment. Let's talk about Dilophosaurus, which is a dinosaur that we haven't seen since the first movie. Um, I was very reserved with that one because I, I felt, I, I think that our memory of it, having solely seen it as an animatronic uh, and never digitally animated, uh, was something that we would we would cry foul if we saw that animal uh, not be an animatronic, and we knew we would know it was fake. And so, we didn't have a digital model. We used only the animatronic. We were limited to you know to what it could do. But I think the limitations of uh, what animatronics can do are part of what make that character scary. It just kind of stares at you from a stationary spot, uh, and then suddenly it's right in front of you. And uh, when it's there, it's it's horribly nasty and spits on you. And I just hate things that spit on you. It's, I hate it more than any other dinosaur. <laughs> Don't like being spit on. And it's the worst nightmare. And I would die by any other dinosaur but that one. And then we have to talk about the T-Rex, of course. The T-Rex in this one, this is, you know, the beginning of the movie, which is which is online in our in our prologue. We just gave it to people early on. That's that's the first five minutes of the film. Uh, and so, you know, if, when you watch that as one long thread, it really does reveal that this is a revenge picture over 65 million years. Sometimes revenge takes a long, a long time. Uh, and uh, we really wanted to find a way that, that she could uh, be of, be of great uh, importance to the story that we could really, you know, follow a narrative if we were, if we were paying attention about her arc. Uh, but also that at the end, you know, we, we know that she's safe. I think we all want our, our heroes that we love as children to be safe. And I, I love that she finds family. I, I, hopefully that's not a, I don't think that's a spoiler. I think we just want to see that. Did this character evolve from the last movie? And if so, what was done? Yeah, we did go back. You know, we, we went back and did a bit of a study on on the original uh, T-Rex model from Jurassic Park uh, because we had made so many adjustments that were story based over the years. And in, in Jurassic World, uh, you know, she was older. And so we, 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 we did change her. She had, you know, she'd aged. 24, 25 years. And so we, we wanted to, to note that. And, and then in J.A.'s movie, uh, you know, she hadn't been eating as well. So she was a little more emaciated. Uh, and then this one, we just wanted to compare where we landed with her back to where she was and, and just make sure that it really, uh, as, she, as she reached her final moment, felt, uh, felt like the, the Rexy we know and love. Now, these take such a long time to create, goes without saying, but I mean, you know, ILM's constantly evolving things like, you know, the muscles and, you know, the texture of the skin and things like that. When did you start developing the dinosaurs for this movie? Uh, we started, let's see, Emily and I wrote in 2018, started in the summer of 2018. Kevin Jenkins, actually, our production designer, came from uh, Star Wars. That's where we met. And he uh, was involved both, you know, in in design, architectural design and, and, and the creation of creatures. And so this was the first time that our dinosaurs were created in uh, from the production design department as opposed to from ILM. It was done in collaboration. But we had a different process in that we would draw first and, and find a, a 3D look uh, that felt right. Then we would make a clay model. Uh, and then that clay model was scanned. And from there, it could go on two workflow paths. One is it goes to the animatronics department and, and uh, 
turns into a you know a 3D printed uh, figure that then becomes an animatronic, or it turns into a digital model. But the the thing that I think feels different about this one is that even the digital creatures they're all they were all made by hand by somebody at some point. So hopefully hopefully you feel that. And while you were at ILM, did you reconnect with Dennis Muren, for example, who worked on Star Wars and also uh, the original Jurassic Park? I did. We were at ILM London. Uh, so I'm, I've seen Dennis several times in the past couple of years, but he, uh, he, uh, he's, you know, he's a great legend. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he would always duck in on the first one. I spent a lot more time in San Francisco. Uh, so it was great to be able to just to get eyes on it for him, Gary Reisterman and sound like there's just, you know, all these, all these amazing geniuses who worked on the first films, just checking out what we're doing. And, and he would honestly push us further. He would, he would see what we were doing and, and, they would all say the same things. Don't, don't make it like Jurassic park. We made Jurassic park, like make, make your thing. Uh, and I took that to heart as uh, if you've seen the movie, you can tell. <laughs> and sound was actually my next question. What did you talk with Gary Rydstrom about? Uh, he'll just come and listen when the mix is at a certain place. He'll just kind of wander in. And I, I was at Skywalker for quite a while, almost six, seven weeks this time. And it's, it's such an amazing collaborative environment. Uh, and, and this team that I've been working with, uh, Mix safety not guaranteed. From the very beginning, I've been with the same group at, at Skywalker Sound, and so uh, for all of us to to know each other well enough that they can come in with with a mix that that does reflect, you know, my values when it comes to sound and how a movie should feel, and then for us to really be able to work together and 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 take the mix to another place. I, I think the sound on this movie is extraordinary. I think they did an unbelievable job. Do you want to talk about creating the voice, if you will, of one of the dinosaurs? Well, yeah, the Therizinosaurus uh, is uh, doesn't have a, a traditional vocal at all. It, it it communicates with echolocation, and so we wanted to use the surrounds, specifically the Atmos surrounds, if you see it that way, uh, to make you feel disoriented uh, by the sounds that it makes to to guide itself through the forest. And they're happening all around you, and they actually happen everywhere except from the place it's actually coming from. Uh, and I don't think you register that when you're watching it, but you just feel a little uncomfortable, which I think is good sometimes in a movie. That whole sequence is very uncomfortable. Uh, and so upping the discomfort by you know making it both look and sound unlike anything you've ever heard uh, or seen, um, I think helped us, you know, be clear in that moment. It's, it's a very, uh, there's a real empathy that happens, uh, cinematic empathy in that moment. You feel like you're in just as much danger as the character. There's a lot of things we saw in the movie where you pay homage to the original movie. Um, are there any maybe surprising Easter eggs that we might miss that we should look for? <laughs> you know, I, tr I tried so hard not to do it, which is why it amazes me how many of them actually ended up <laughs> happening. Cause I was pushing against homage and nostalgia at all times. Uh, Cause I felt like, well, just having Laura, Sam and Jeff in this movie is, and BD is inherently nostalgic. We're already, we already did it. And yet uh, I think just because, uh, you know, it's in my DNA. Uh, I hopefully it feels organic. I really love the moment when uh, Jeff Goldblum tries to unbutton his shirt, and Kayla's like, "No, nah, no, <laughs> don't do it." Uh, I like it when something uh, like that shows us how we've changed. I, you know, as you know, the shaving cream can is in the movie, but it's treated not as a plot device, but as an idol, as something that represents something uh, to a guy who's fallen. And uh, I like the moment toward the end when when three humans triangulate a raptor. And I think from the first movie, when you if you remember how they explained uh, the way raptors kill people, uh, that that's the one that I like. What did you talk with Steven Spielberg about? Uh, he's very straightforward in his note this time, and often he'll just say one thing that almost uh, sounds obvious, and then as you make your way through the movie, it continues to echo in your head, and you realize why he chose that one thing to say. And uh, this time, he just said, "Remember the characters." And he knew what he'd read the script. He knew what we were attempting to do. He knew there were going to be massive sequences uh, that were going to be very exciting. But to never forget uh, the need for moments like you know, Laura Dern telling uh, Maisie Lockwood how she knew her mother. Uh, that's that's really crucial in a movie like this. And, and I, I kept it in my mind at every moment. What's next for you? What's next for me? I, I am really uh, invested in producing other filmmakers and and younger filmmakers who who have that same kind of uh, passion to, to share their voice and their perspective as I did, you know, when I made Safety Not Guaranteed. And so that's a real priority of mine. And, and hopefully the next thing I'll be involved with uh, uh, is a movie that that um, 
a young woman wrote and is going to direct that I that I think is just amazingly brilliant, and I'm just excited to be involved. Um, and and for myself, um, I, I'm really uh, fascinated with our first civilization that that uh, collapsed once before. In this moment, we're all afraid our own civilization is going to collapse. So I'm I'm making uh, an Atlantis trilogy of films uh, about the first time we had it, and it all went away. It was great talking to you about your film. Congratulations, and thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Carolyn. <laughs>